Good morning. Uh, my name is Jim Dingman. Welcome to the second of the Noisy Reality discussions on the history of the Second World War. Um, just to let people know, we're going to be doing a series of five talks on the whole question of the Second Front in Europe in 1942. That will start next week with uh, Professor Mark Stoller. Uh, I just got an email from retired Professor Emeritus Robert Paxton at Columbia University, who many of you may know uh, is uh, partially responsible for the internal debate in France about the issue of collaboration with his book, Vichy and the Jews, that was published in the late 60s. And he's offered to talk about what the Vichy response would be if a landing occurred in France in 1942. So look forward to that. And we will, of course, let people know by email what's going on. Uh, I just want to let you know that uh, the noisy reality idea is not just simply to deal with military history topics, but to deal with broad political, current affairs, and uh, cultural topics. And we will explore that as we go. But without further ado, let me have Jason McDonald introduce uh, John Prados today. And uh, I turn it over to Jason. I'm really excited to uh, uh, introduce uh, Dr. Prados. Um, he has a, a PhD in political science from Columbia University and is a senior fellow with the National Security Archive. Um, and I've just been really, really impressed with his books, uh, especially uh, um, Combined Fleet Decoded. Um, and so uh, he's here today to talk about the uh, attack on Clark Field in the Philippines, um, which is something uh, I studied uh, interviewing uh, surviving veterans um, from the attack. Um, I interviewed uh, the wife of a person um, who, who uh, survived the Clark Field attack. So it's something that I'm really excited to introduce. Um, and Dr. Prados, uh, please take it away. Okay, thank you very much. It's uh, good to meet with all of you today. Uh, although the occasion of our meeting is kind of um, um, upsetting, let's say, because of what's going on in the world. But this gives us an opportunity to step back and think of a, a historical problem. Uh, and by the way, uh, a problem of the mysteries of histories. And by, what, by that, what I mean is um, here is an instance where we've got a set of historical events. It happens December the 7th, 1941, uh, local time, Pearl Harbor time, uh, East Coast time, the first day of uh, America's World War II. On that same day, out in the Far East, beyond the international date line, in the Philippines, uh, Japanese uh, Army and Navy aircraft attack the uh, American slash Filipino defenses in the Philippines, including some notable bombings, uh, especially of air bases in the immediate vicinity of Manila. That bombing has often been called the other Pearl Harbor, hence uh, our title for this talk today. Now, with the other Pearl Harbor, the central um, conundrum, the central problem is that the events of the Japanese bombing and what happens around Manila that day occur hours after the Pearl Harbor attack itself. In fact, about nine hours if we sat down and, and calculated it out, okay? Yet the American forces in the Philippines are taken by surprise just as uh, the American forces were taken by surprise at Pearl Harbor itself. So our question is, our mystery is, how could this happen? And that, the subject of today's talk. Now, what I want to do here is uh, 
with all of us make us a sounding board and let's figure out if we can solve this historical mystery okay um there are three central viewpoints one is the point of view of the American commander of air forces in the Philippines, a general named Louis Brereton. The second is a general who is the chief of staff to Douglas MacArthur, that's Richard K. Sutherland. And the third is MacArthur himself. So there are three bodies essentially of evidence that relate to this story. What I want to do here is um, provide you with a, a sort of a starting point, which is a straightforward uh, recounting of the chronology of the hours before and during the attack on the airfields. Then talk about the evidence from those three characters that I just mentioned, because for each of them, there's something good and something bad about the evidence. And then after that, let's see if we can solve the historical mystery. So this is the mysteries of history. And the subject is the bombing of Clark Field, December the 8th, 1941, Philippines time. Okay. Now, we're situated in the Philippines. It's December the 8th. It's uh, pre dawn hours. And our chronology starts at about 0300. According to Douglas MacArthur and his account of these events, uh, his first knowledge of the attack on Pearl Harbor came at that time about 0300 from a telephone call from Washington. Afterwards, there's a succession of new events that um, call into, or should have called into everyone's mind, um, what to do and uh, what to be on the lookout for in this situation. At 0330 hours, about half an hour later, uh, uh, Manila Radio carries a report, which they picked up from Honolulu Radio, that Pearl Harbor had been attacked. So at that time, about 3.30 in the morning, the headquarters of United States Forces Philippines becomes aware, this is now beyond MacArthur himself, becomes aware that Pearl Harbor has been attacked, okay? Two hours later at 5.30 in the morning, the War Department's official notice to American forces in the Pacific that Pearl Harbor has been attacked uh, comes out and that message from the War Department directs American local forces throughout the region to execute their assignments under the US war plan, a plan that was known at that time as Rainbow Five. Under Rainbow Five, American forces in the Philippines were designated to attack Japanese bases on Formosa i.e. AK Taiwan, we now mostly know it as Taiwan, but uh, American forces to attack Formosa. American forces that could have attacked Formosa were a set of A-17 bombers, medium to heavy bombers, which had begun to arrive in the Philippines in uh, late 1941, November of 1941. They were the main striking power of the Far East Air Forces, which was the Air Command that General Brereton was in charge of. And Brereton is the person who um, 
who is the really the, the central character in this story, um, his actions being either assisted or obstructed by the other two characters that we're, we're dealing with. Okay. Brereton, according to his account, goes to uh, Far East Forces headquarters about five o'clock in the morning, just before the War Department's official order to execute Rainbow Five, and asks to speak to General MacArthur. The chief of staff who's in charge of the headquarters, General Richard K. Sutherland, um, denies Brereton access to MacArthur. They have a conversation back and forth. Brereton wants to execute this planned strike on Formosa. Sutherland says no. Um, and he says that um, really they need, before they can decide what to do, uh, photographic coverage of the Japanese bases uh, on Formosa. Okay. Brereton, who has known about the attack on Pearl Harbor since about a half hour after the news was carried on the Philippine radio stations, um, sees the question of uh, air photography of the Japanese bases as useful for the purposes of planning a bombing, but it's also problematic because the um, United States has only two aircraft that are capable of carrying out a photographic mission, and they're not prepared to fly over Formosa right at this moment. Later on, there's another complication. It turns out there's some problem with the photographic equipment, and extra photographic equipment has to be flown up from Nichols Field near Manila to Clark Air Force Base near Manila um, in order to configure the aircraft to carry out this mission. That's a side issue that can come back in to this conversation. At uh, 7.15 a.m., uh, Brereton goes back to MacArthur's headquarters where General Sutherland again denies him access to MacArthur, claiming that MacArthur is busy with other people. Okay. Within an hour of that, uh, a US radar base in this area at a, another airfield called Iba detects uh, aircraft in flight between Formosa and the Philippines. American fighter planes are scrambled to go intercept these Japanese aircraft. Um, there are uh, observers on the radar sets who, who see, point to their reports, that uh, the blob that represents the American interceptors merges with the blob that represents the Japanese aircraft in flight, but actually no interception occurs and there is no aerial engagement. Later on, they decide it's because the American airplanes were at a lower altitude than the Japanese bombers and never saw them, thus they never intercepted. So this first bunch of uh, Japanese airplanes goes right by. Around 9.15 in the morning, uh, we begin to get reports of uh, places, points along the Philippine coast that are being bombed by Japanese airplanes. Okay, so Clark Field is the main base for the Far East Air Force, and it's the location where this force of B-17 bombers has been based. It's also 
the center of the ring of airfields around Manila, several of which I've already mentioned in this talk, which uh, represent the concentration of the forces of General Brereton's um, force. The Far East Air Force is concerned that um, these fields, especially Clark, not be attacked by the Japanese. So in addition to scrambling fighters to um, uh, intercept this force that the EBA radar finds, they also get the B-17s in the air so that they themselves won't be caught on the ground in case this Japanese force comes in and attacks Clark Field. Okay, let's shift gears for a moment and look at the Japanese side. Turns out that um, accidents of fate, if you like, uh, greatly affect this situation. Those airplanes that were seen on the Iba radar are actually bombers from the Japanese Army's Air Force, not the Japanese Navy's Air Force. And they had not been assigned to attack Clark Field. Instead, they had specifically been assigned to attack these other places on the Philippine coast and a few inland where the Japanese intended to land troops um, some days later. The main attack, the attack against Clark Field and bases that were right around Manila was critically delayed. In order to make a dawn attack on Manila uh, and in order to uh, operationalize their entire plan, the Japanese had a critical problem in that uh, there's a difference of thousands of miles between Manila and Pearl Harbor. And they could not plan an attack that was um, simultaneous between Pearl Harbor and Manila because of the geographic locations of these places. The best the Japanese could do was to time their attack force taking off from Formosa for the late pre-dawn hours in order to arrive over Manila at dawn, Manila time. But during that time on that day, there was a major fog over Formosa and the Japanese were not safe launching their attack force at that hour. They themselves had to wait for the fog to dissipate. The fog did not dissipate until about dawn, which was the time that their original plan provided for the attack force to be over Manila. So, so much for their plan, their plan had to go out the window they launched their attack force when they could. It headed off for the Philippines and it's on its way to Manila, where in fact it arrives between 11 in the morning and 12 noon. What happens from the American side again is that the fighters that had taken off to intercept the Japanese bombers that they first saw the bombers that came from the Japanese Army Air Force eventually had to go back, land, and refuel and rearm. And the bombers, the American bombers that we sent off to prevent their being caught on the ground at Clark Field, they eventually were low on uh, fuel and they had to land as well. Both of those things happened between 11 and 12 o'clock in the morning. That meant that, in fact, the Japanese Navy strike force 
the naval aircraft that were going to attack Clark Field arrived over Clark Field right as uh, the Americans landed, giving the Japanese the effect of surprise, even though, or regardless of whether in fact the Americans were taken by surprise. The next result of this was that only American interceptors based other than the immediate places where the Japanese were showing up could be effective in intercepting uh, the Japanese forces. A few American aircraft actually did get into the air and a few American aircraft were able to engage. Only uh, a fraction of the interceptors that we set out from other airfields because um, one of the first effects of the Japanese attack was to wipe out the uh, radar and the communications um, uh, network at Iba airfield. And at another one of the American airfields, communications failed. So some of our forces were unable to intervene in this situation for technical reasons or for uh, or because of physical damage. Okay, um, that result of this was about half of the US B-17 force at Clark Field was wiped out and uh, uh, a majority of the Americans' uh, more recent interceptor aircraft, D-40 interceptor fighters uh, were lost on December the 8th, 1941. This disaster crippled the Far East Air Force at the very beginning of the Philippine campaign of 1941. And uh, we went down to um, eventual defeat, but we went down, we were whittled down to the point where remaining American air forces were withdrawn to the Netherlands East Indies for them to continue in a kind of a broken backed air campaign to help defend allied forces in this wider regional uh, fight. So uh, much like Pearl Harbor, it turned out that in the Philippines, there was a successful Japanese attack, call it surprise attack or not, which greatly impacted the American potential defense of the Philippine sector. And therefore, this was uh, a historical, a point of contention, a point of dispute, a point of uh, historical sensitivity, if you like. Um, and you have next the question of, well, what really was the role? What really was the responsibility of the various American commanders, generals, senior officials that I mentioned. And this brings us to the question of evidence. In history, evidence obviously is uh, central to the, uh, the project, to the whole enterprise of trying to tell a history and assemble a narrative. And the evidence about Clark Field and the attacks of December the 8th, 1941, is very interesting because there are um, flaws, if you like, weaknesses, if you like, or manipulations, if you like, of all the key pieces of evidence, okay? First, let's take General Brereton, because it was Brereton who was in command of the Air Force, and he's a key figure in um, the whole question of um, what the airplanes did, because he is their leading commander. Now, Brereton's uh, account was that he tried a couple of times to get into Seymour Parker. Uh, Sutherland prevented him from doing so. 
he also says, which I neglected to mention here, um, that somewhere after 10 o'clock, but before 11, so in that period before war had come to Manila, if you like, um, he received a telephone call from General MacArthur, who said to him, sure, um, attacking Formosa sounds like a good idea. I want you to be in charge of it. So according to this account, uh, Brereton says that MacArthur gave him the authority to go ahead. Uh, Brereton did not use that authority to preempt this idea of the photographic mission or anything like that. But uh, the central point here is that there was this conversation where most of his account is that uh, he was prevented from directly discussing with Nicole. Okay, now, um, <clears throat> Rareton's account was contained in uh, what was later represented as the war diary of the Far East Air Force. And it was a set of notes on US air operations that were compiled contemporaneously. And they were published after World War II uh, as the Brereton Diary, okay? However, if you take a look at the, uh, the notes, the physical notes that turned into the published Brereton Diary and various uh, official historians working for uh, the U.S. Army, U.S. Army Air Force, et cetera, have done this. Um, they found a number of uh, questionable aspects about this evidence. For one thing, um, the, the war diary, if you like, was compiled on paper um, of different sizes, different weights, uh, and um, sort of like uh, oddly, uh, uh, you know, stuck together with like a, a binder clip. Not only that, but um, the dating has question marks associated with it. A number of the dates, including December the 8th, were uh, lined out or they were marked for another year, like December the 8th, 1942, instead of 41. A number of the other dates, uh, and some of the ones that were marked 42, were lined out and dates were written in, in uh, handwriting, in cursive. There were uh, alterations made in the text in some places. And some of this was uh, in the short term assessed as being, well, the text of the documents might be questionable, but the contents of the operations of the uh, Far East Air Force units uh, was so detailed and so um, informative that uh, they decided they would let this evidence stand as evidence. And uh, the explanation for these changes that had been made in the evidence was um, that perhaps, uh, let me step back one second, Brereton, um, the general, you know, had commanded air forces in the Philippines. When he left the Philippines, he was sent to the Netherlands, East Indies, to command U.S. air forces there. And when he left there, he went to India, where he commanded U.S. air forces in India and the China, uh, Burma, India combat theaters. 
So the, the theoretics were that uh, headquarters staff in India slash CBI were the ones who did this compilation and made these cursive changes in the record that Brechin had been compiling. And that record followed him because Brechin later served in the Mediterranean and then was an air commander in England for the uh, Normandy campaign and uh, uh, the Arnhem battle. Those records followed him and eventually went back to Washington where they were used by historians looking into this question of the Manila battle. So here you have Brereton. He publishes this diary and that gets us to MacArthur. When Brereton's diary appeared in print, MacArthur issued a public statement. In that public statement, he claimed that he had never um, heard of a plan to bomb Formosa, that uh, if there had been a plan to bomb Formosa, surely that was an important thing that should have been brought up with him personally. And he never saw Brereton, who never proposed any such plan to him. So what's going on here is more or less the uh, effect of um, MacArthur's intervention here. MacArthur's intervention, however, wasn't the only piece of evidence here. Uh, in his own um, account of the war, his memoir, it published, I think, in 1964, I remember, um, MacArthur confirms that he first heard of the, uh, the bombing of Pearl Harbor in this telephone call from Washington at three o'clock in the morning. That suggests that MacArthur was aware of this attack of the, the combat status of the war immediately and before these other people like Sutherland, like Britain. And that raises the question of what was MacArthur up to in all this time before anybody else knew about the situation? And why wasn't he ordering an attack on Formosa from the first moment? Uh, that other account, the uh, uh, memoir account, also um, reveals, which is confirmed by War Department records, that uh, in his message responding to the War Department's instruction to carry out Rainbow Five, the Philippine command, i.e. MacArthur, mentioned that they planned uh, a B-17 strike on Formosa. Thus, um, the plan that MacArthur is telling us he never heard of features in a MacArthur dispatch to Washington where he informs the War Department what he intends to do in response to uh, this new situation of hostilities. Okay. There are other uh, things here, but uh, maybe we do or do not get into those details as we're trying to figure out this mystery. And the third leg of this uh, tripod is General Richard K. Sutherland. Now, Sutherland uh, gave an interview to an army historian while the war was still going on. He, Sutherland, that is, uh, remained MacArthur's chief of staff during the whole war, which meant that in 1944-45, he was landing back in the Philippines with General MacArthur and was uh, present for the entire campaign for this period, okay? So army historian gets to Sutherland while uh, Sutherland's uh, 
So Westpac you know, is the name of MacArthur's final uh, command, the Southwest Pacific Command. While So Westpac headquarters is located in Manila and is uh, conducting the final battle for the Philippines. Okay. In 1945, when this interview occurs, um, Sutherland claims that uh, he never heard of um, this attack plan for Formosa, which he would have been responsible for compiling the dispatch that Manila sent to the War Department, which mentions this attack. He also says that it's Brereton's fault for uh, not having gotten the B-17 aircraft out of uh, Clark Field and uh, sending them to dispersal bases in other places in the Philippines. Brereton, by the way, says that the idea of dispersing the B-17 bombers to other places in the Philippines, most important of them, Del Monte Airfield uh, on Mindanao, was his idea, the Far East Air Force's idea, not uh, MacArthur or Sutherland's idea at all, and that they were prevented from uh, doing that. Now, as it happens, half the B-17 force was uh, evacuated or sent to dispersal airfields. But that still meant that half of it got caught um, on Clark Field. Now, other records that should have uh, appeared in So West Pack archives that would have provided information on these different uh, aspects of uh, the December 8th, 1941 situation were not in the files and could never be found. So something happened with the headquarters files. They were weeded to take out information that specifically bore on the Clark Field attack. Then in 1946, now MacArthur is in Japan and he is the commander of the Allied powers in Japan and their occupation and uh, um, General Sutherland is still with him, still as the chief of staff and is still responding to historians interviews. So the army official historian who compiled the volume of the army official history that covers the fall of the Philippines interviews Sutherland again. This time, Sutherland does a 180 and says that, um, oh yes, uh, they uh, wanted the uh, air photographs of Formosa before executing the offensive strike with B-17s against the Japanese bases. Um, so uh, it would have been um, foolhardy or foolish to carry out a bombing of Formosa without having uh, complete target files, um, target folders on the places that uh, the United States intended to attack. Okay, so Sutherland is uh, uh, playing both ends against the middle in these contacts with historians and doing something with uh, the records that are maintained in headquarters files. So there you go. We have a whole set of circumstances. We have a couple of potential explanations for what happened the way it did. Then we have uh, who could have been responsible for the action. Let's see if we can solve this historical problem. Now, before we go there, uh, let me ask if anyone has 
questions about the story so far? Uh, on the second the strike, the naval strike, naval aircraft, Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned that they got the radar installation, but had they been detected by radar and there had there been a similar warning that went out? Because obviously the first one seemed like it was, they effectively used the radar uh, up to a point. <laughs> obviously they missed, but at least they detected it. The warning got there and they scrambled the aircraft. And yes. uh, also just, just a second question of that is, did they purposely uh, target the radar or was it just... Or, or do you even know that, the Japanese? Uh, I don't know if they purposely targeted the radar, but to, to take the first part of your question, uh, yes, the Japanese formation was detected incoming. That's where the, um, the communications problem uh, came to the fore as well as the situation with the American aircraft at Clark itself. Because the American aircraft at Clark uh, were expended, if you like, they had used up their fuel and uh, ammunition in the case of the fighters, right? They had to be serviced before they could be sent up again. So they were out of contention. And the, uh, the communications breakdown between Clark Field and uh, Nichols and other U.S. airfields around um, uh, Manila uh, reduced the impact of uh, the American counteraction against the second strike. However, some American fighters did respond to that radar warning and did get into the air. That's where you get um, the story of uh, American uh, planes intercepting the Japanese. For example, there's uh, a Japanese uh, fighter ace, his name is Sakai Saburo, who uh, was in a Zero fighter that was flying cover for these bombers on this mission. And he writes in his memoir of um, shooting down various American planes, including ones over Clark Field that are trying to oppose them. Uh, and his account can be traced to American sources and down to the identity of the pilot who must have been in that plane that Sakai shot down. So there was a response, but the response was critically uh, impeded by communications difficulties. And uh, I should say also by the... Um, nature of the American aircraft. You know, uh, the American aircraft in the Manila sector were P-40Es and P-40As uh, and P-35s. And the P-35s and P-40As had limited uh, altitude because they had uh, little um, in the case of the P-35, zero. In the case of the P-40A, limited uh, oxygen and therefore couldn't get to the highest altitudes. Mm. P-40Es could get to the higher altitudes, but the Japanese were effectively above their altitude. They couldn't climb quickly enough to get to them. Okay, but there was a, there was a warning that from the radar station to Clark yes, Field. there was a warning. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, I don't. Um, maybe maybe it's my turn. Um, I wanted to ask. Uh, I had read or heard um, that uh, MacArthur suffered something of a nervous breakdown for a period of time. Um, did did you research or ha have you heard of? of anything to substantiate this? Um, that's a good point. I would say I haven't seen uh, direct claims about MacArthur's mental status. Um, that's uh, a subject that is as controversial as the attack on Clark Field itself. Um, I would think that uh, Sutherland would be 
uh, I'm, you know, among the foremost trying to uh, keep that kind of thing quiet. I would also speculate that uh, MacArthur, who, by the way, um, had an ulterior motive in all of this, which was that uh, he was uh, trying to somehow uh, keep the Philippines out of the war, thinking that if we didn't attack out of the Philippines, that the Japanese wouldn't have any reason to attack the Philippines. Um, that could have uh, put him in the position of getting caught out on one of his major uh, interests and contentions. Um, and uh, be worth uh, covering up, if you like. And part of the question here is why is it uh, helpful to cover up? Um, John? Yeah. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay. Um, my question, that, that message, uh, supposed message from the uh, British in the armor, uh, yeah, Indian Army unit that was being attacked uh, about an hour before um, in real time, the actual Pearl Harbor attack. What happened with that into the MacArthur's headquarters? Um, I don't have any information that uh, the Philippine command learned of that attack before the events that happened in the Philippines. So I can't really say. Look at him. Just want to remind everyone to please use the uh, reactions uh, raise hand feature, and we will call on you. Um, Alex, I believe you are next. Yeah. Okay, thanks, Jason. Um, yeah. So uh, my question is, um, how much is kind of does um, MacArthur's reputation, you know, you know, during and then after the war precede him on this? And you know that he's a prima donna, that he's willing to lie to protect his um, reputation, and that maybe people are unfair to MacArthur just because you know it seems like the what actually happened is somewhat unclear. Uh, John, I I think that MacArthur acquired a reputation over his whole career. So yes, you're quite right that. This factor already exists going into the events of 1941. So, um, whether we want to judge or not that uh, that whole thing colors the debate over what happened on December the 8th uh, is certainly a question that uh, should be asked. Uh, and how much weight we give to it, I don't know. What do you think? Yeah, I'm not sure just because, you know, with Brereton's own account, it's a little confusing as to, you know, how accurate he is. And I mean, obviously, we can think that this is, you know, in the middle of the beginning days of a war and, you know, accurate record keeping of it by any of the individuals involved is not, you know, a high priority. So, and, you know, memories can change and all of that. And, um, you know, obviously everybody has ref, not just MacArthur, but Brereton. So and they all have reputations to protect. And um, so, you know, uh, and that means we can't basically trust anybody. And so I guess one question to that is, are there any subordinates out there who we have, who were interviewed or, or who said something after the war that would confirm, you know, what really happened essentially. Well, I would say the main source for uh, commentary of this sort is uh, Richard Sutherland. And he's got his own set of uh, um, reasons, you know, uh, he protected MacArthur and took his side all the way through the war. Um, so he's kind of uh, uh, kind of stuck with his position. Now, 
Having said that, let me also add that you know, there's a whole um, uh, archive that consists entirely of material by and about MacArthur in Norfolk, Virginia. I have not been there or done this research, but somebody who wanted to do that could probably find oral histories with subordinate staff officers in the Far East forces from 1941 that could furnish commentary on this point. I just have not done that research. Do, do any of obviously there are many MacArthur biographers, so do yeah, any of them look at Clayton yeah. James's papers, look at Fraser Hunt's papers? That's right, Brandon, and then Miles. Yeah, I just I guess a follow on to what Alex and others were asking, which is the, the William Manchester biography, American Caesar. He, he goes into this nervous breakdown thing in a lot of detail. I think he concludes, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, that at a minimum there was a period where MacArthur was incommunicado, uh, yes. that his staff officers were screening him. Now, this is at a crucial time in, in the war, obviously, and he's just been caught in a surprise attack. I wonder how things went from there to him being appointed one of the three major commands in the Pacific without there being um, a formal investigation on any level. I just wonder if you stumbled across or, or what you even think of MacArthur, bio, of the uh, Manchester biography and its approach. Um, I think Manchester did a, a great piece of uh, historical work there. I agree that uh, he was held in communicado. I think that's the best explanation for Sutherland's exchanges with uh, Brereton on the day of the 8th. Um, and uh, like yourself, I'm mystified by the question of why there was no inquiry. Um, two days after, now East Coast US time, December the 9th, there's a, a news conference where FDR is asked, oh, well, look what happened in Manila. What do you say about that? And FDR expresses great surprise. Now, as we know, FDR was also in the situation of uh, great surprise on the Pearl Harbor attack, which, of course, became uh, a big historical controversy there. And... Um, it could very well be, and I'm just speculating here, that there's that no historical, or I shouldn't say historical, no responsibility investigation is possible for what happened at Manila without opening the door to uh, a more detailed, more in-depth historical investigation of responsibilities for Pearl Harbor, and that that was an issue that uh, Washington preferred to avoid. Thank you. Miles? Yeah, uh, thank you. Um, you uh, started the, uh, your account uh, today, for which I thank you, uh, at uh, 0300 Manila time. And uh, my understanding is that days before then, there was a, a war warning from the War Department to all uh, Pacific commands, mm -hmm. including Pearl Harbor. This came out in spades in the, in the um, post uh, late war and post war investigations on Pearl Harbor. Uh, but they also, uh, uh, I understand, went to all Pacific commands, this war warning. And you, you have uh, reminded us of the Rainbow Five plan, which um, uh, apparently included the attack on the planned attack on Formosa. Um, so one would have expected that the response to um, uh, the war warning would be to pull uh, the Rainbow Five plan out of the filing cabinet 
and um, um, have uh, staff meetings, etc., to uh, uh, prepare the response in a, in a man of war, which would be a normal uh, response of a headquarters to a war warning. Uh, and you would have expected Brereton to be part of that or, or to have um, initiated his own staff planning to say, okay, uh, if and when the balloon goes up, uh, here's what we're going to do in what sequence, um, which would have been a good time to talk about uh, uh, photo reconnaissance and getting the uh, and getting the cameras or other equipment in the right place uh, to use it. Uh, so, it, and here again, this would be a a place where, as mentioned, other personnel might. Um, know what, if anything, happened in response to the war warning. So that's really my question. What went on uh, during the days uh, uh, before December 8th? What was going on in Manila in response to the war warning? And, and by the way, uh, I just say one other, one other thought, which is that uh, as far as um, when the um, fad was in the fire about the uh, Pearl Harbor, that there were congressional investigations immediately after the war, which um, uh, would have been a good time to have brought up the broader subject of um, preparedness and responses throughout the Pacific, but that's another subject. Yes. Uh, just to start with um, your last point there, um, that was the perfect opportunity to go into here in considerable detail. Uh, and yet, uh, beyond a few brief references to what happened in Manila, there is no actual um, investigation of the Manila uh, events that was part of the Pearl Harbor Joint Committee uh, hearing. That's a whole mystery in and of itself. Uh, so we're adding mysteries to our list of mysteries. <laughs> But you're, you're quite right. Um, now, to go back to your main point, this may add to uh, the question of MacArthur's embarrassment. Um, there was and were uh, US uh, reconnaissance and photography missions flown out toward Formosa in the days before December the 8th, I think, mm -hmm. starting around the second, if I remember this right. But uh, MacArthur um, set rulings about how close to uh, Formosa, how, whether the aircraft could penetrate uh, Formosa airspace, go over Formosa, or stay in international waters. And he set boundaries on uh, where they could actually physically fly. And um, the result of that was that they couldn't do uh, direct photographic missions over the Japanese bases of which there were something like 22 uh, on Formosa at that time. And so they didn't have the right level of detail. Now, according to some sources, um, uh, the, the warning that you mentioned uh, it actually went out on November the 27th. And uh, MacArthur recounts that the, um, the, um, the intent of Washington was and remained that uh, Tokyo be left to make the first aggressive maneuver, which is why uh, MacArthur supposedly set these limits on where the photographic reconnaissance missions could fly. It was part of this don't take aggressive action approach to the situation. So um, be that as it may, that contributes to MacArthur's uh, uh, predisposition 
uh, in terms of accepting responsibilities for different things that happened. It's also the case that the Japanese were flying uh, scouting missions uh, over and near the Philippines, and that that EBA radar was still operational before December the 8th, and that American planes scrambled to intercept these Japanese aircraft. But because there wasn't um, a state of war or hostilities uh, in that situation, there weren't any shooting incidents in this little game of uh, I intercept, you scout kind of thing. But those things were going on by the day in the days before December the 8th. Thank you so much, Dr. Prados. Um, does anyone else have any um, questions that they would like to ask? Well, I would like to um, to ask, I, I uh, have found the Manila newspapers to be a, a really great source of information about what was happening. Um, so uh, I was wondering if you, uh, I think they're on fold three. I, I don't know if you have access to that, Dr. Prados or not, but um, have you have you looked at any of the Manila newspapers from the period and and seen how how uh, that you know was playing out in the press the 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 war nerves the 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 reaction to the attack that kind of thing? That's a very good point. Um, no, I confess I have not. This was uh, a um, this was a casual. Uh, uh, interest. I haven't actually um, gone in to conduct specifically focused research on Manila December the 8th. I was trying to uh, think of something that would provoke thought. And that's a good thought. Go in and get the Manila uh, reporting and see what it says. Great yeah. idea. I believe it's on Fold 3. Um, so if you have a subscription to Fold 3, it'd be it'd be free. You just have to um, go through the Manila newspapers. It's, fa it's a fascinating read, I mean, to, to look at what was going on. Uh, you know, I mean, like I always assume journalists have a particular bi bias one way or the other, but it's interesting to see how the paper changed uh, from the American, you know, colonialist period before uh, the Japanese arrive in Manila in December 1941 to the Japanese occupation. Gary, yeah. you have a question. Are you there, Gary? Yeah, sorry, I'm doing this on my phone, so I had to get it unmuted. Uh, yeah, so, it, you know, it occurs to me there's two reasons maybe MacArthur escaped blame, and that's one, you know, he's involved in a active campaign and it might be quite distracting and difficult to undertake an inquiry right at that point in time but the other reason it seems to me that occurs to me anyway is that obviously at some point he becomes this big national hero he gets the congressional medal of honor even though he screwed up everything in my opinion but beyond even what happened on december 8th um and so you know, they don't want to step on that message. You know, things aren't going very well in the Pacific. So we don't, the last thing we want to do is, is you know, get our big hero reputation hurt and get into that kind of a controversy. But so, but that, that, so that's what occurs to me. But as evidence one way or another, do we have a handle? I know at some point he becomes this big hero, but on December, already December 8th, at the beginning of this whole process, is he, is, is does he have a presence in the American conscious, the public consciousness, as being this you know significant figure, uh, you know with you know some weighty reputation, or does that develop later? Does, do you have a uh, any handle on that? I would think he does have uh, a significant reputation uh, for Americans in the United States, primarily because. If you go back to the early 1930s, he was chief of staff of the U.S. Army, and um, uh, one of the persons who's most responsible for the, um, the government actions against the bonus marchers who had come to Washington to attempt uh, to get 
uh, something to recompense them from World War I, for World War I. So he has this. Later on, he gets appointed to the Philippines where he's uh, uh, the Philippines appoints him a field marshal. So um, to his American reputation is added this whole extra layer of um, um, not so much responsibility, but uh, uh, distinction, let's say. And um, that uh, brings him back to the attention of uh, Americans in a way that's uh, not easily uh, avoidable. So he keeps coming back and he keeps building this reputation and December the 8th is the latest step in it. Thank you, Dr. Pranas. Um, I'm gonna uh, invoke executive privilege and go to Jim Dingman. So uh, um, he organized this whole thing. So we'll we'll go to him uh, next. Yeah, thank you. I'll be very quick because I see a lot of people have their hands up and Ted came in a little later. I do apologize for the screw up of the link. Uh, we'll just have to make sure in the future that doesn't happen again. My apologies to all who were confused by the Zoom link. Uh, John, the first talk we had in this series basically was talking with Martin Melosi, who was talking about the politics of the Pearl Harbor investigation from uh, 41 up to 46. And what strikes me in listening to this discussion is the same people who were pushing for MacArthur to be a presidential candidate in 1944 and 48 were in some cases the same people domestically who were arguing about the responsibility of FDR for Pearl Harbor. In other words, uh, you know, using it for their own uh, partisan political purposes in the elections of uh, the midterms and certainly in the presidential election of 44 and 48. So I'm wondering what your thoughts are about this whole question of how it's uh, related to uh, this issue of his responsibility, lack thereof, of, attack, of the attack on Clark. And also, if you could throw in there the whole question of Korea, because we know he's, uh, you know, relieved because he's sitting there trying to push the envelope, so to speak, with uh, the use of nuclear weapons and expand the war to, uh, to China and Russia. And so I'm wondering how you see that interrelated to these questions of the suppression of what occurred at Clark on December 8th, 1941. Well, that's a lot. Um, it's definitely true that uh, there's a series of wild gyrations, political gyrations around the question of investigation of Pearl Harbor and um, the question of uh, uh, Republican candidature uh, in presidential elections, 44 and 48, uh, 52 as well, by the way. Um, now I'm not sure how you um, sort of dovetail these things together except to say, as I did a moment ago, that um, the, the, uh, the presence or absence of the Clark Field slash Manila uh, controversy within the Pearl Harbor investigations was uh, something to be avoided if you were trying to protect FDR something to be emphasized if you were trying to get at FDR. Um, and uh, FDR had the advantage throughout the wartime period that Democrats were in the ascendant in Congress. So um, it would have been hard as a Republican to get Clark Field into the mix in those investigations at that time. Now, um, I mentioned that uh, in this question of uh, MacArthur's growing uh, reputation and his um, idea of protecting it as, as uh, 
motives for kind of perceiving a certain way with uh, letting out evidence about uh, Clark Field, well, that interest continues into the Korean War period. And in particular, the um, question of whether there was um, uh, in discipline, let's say, between uh, Mr. Truman, between General MacArthur and Mr. Truman, the president, uh, during that 1951 period. The, uh, the MacArthur atomic weapons thing actually became public uh, by MacArthur's own initiative in the memoir that he wrote, which I mentioned earlier in this conversation. Um, so MacArthur was the first one to actually make that public. And um, I think he did so as uh, a token of the idea that he was ready to go all the way. And as you allude to, uh, that could well have had a political content because you're going into um, the next election, 1952, and uh, uh, MacArthur could have um been active or more active in that circumstance but it was kind of overtaken by events by as a result of the wake island conference and the dismissal of macarthur and the hearings that were held about the dismissal of macarthur and u.s far east military policy thanks dr Pradas. um Mark, and then John, and then we'll have Mike for a follow-up. Yeah, uh, first of all, thank you, John. And uh, second, I'll, I'll apologize ahead of time for any uh, noise. Uh, Mardi Gras parades are going outside. Um, so my, and, and if this is outside the realm of your expertise, uh, we'll, we can just skip it. But I'm curious, how, does, how do historians judge MacArthur's defense of the Philippines? Because I'd heard at one point that the Japanese schedule, it took them longer to conquer the Philippines and then, than they had planned. And how do uh, historians judge MacArthur's, you know, uh, run up the, the you know, the, uh, was it New Guinea and then the reconquering of the Philippines and so forth, basically the rest of World War II? How do, how do us historians judge him? Well, that's a good question. I'd say there's a range of opinions to why the field of historians. Uh, different historians have different uh, uh, positions on the whole thing. Uh, for example, uh, if you're a historian, um, is also the evacuation of the Barclay to Australia and the mystery of the efficiency of Alan Powell? Or is it uh, a token of the political value of MacArthur? Or is it a, um, uh, a, uh, a, a political debt to uh, Manuel Quezon and the Philippine um, uh, political figures that the United States is indebted to? Or is it something else? Um, a strictly military uh, proposition that is going to put MacArthur in a position to continue fighting. Uh, there are a variety of, of opinions on that, ranging from um, Manchester, who was just mentioned a few minutes ago, to Fraser Hunt, who would have had a much more uh, friendly attitude for MacArthur. Um, to other historians, uh, Clayton James, who's got a more balanced view in between the extremes. I would say that uh, in general, MacArthur's reputation is high among historians, but that there are outliers on both sides. Another issue is um, 
responsibility for various things, not just here, like in Clark Field, but uh, who's got the lowdown on changing strategies and tactics. The American military commanders, military and naval both, who served in the Pacific in World War II, as you know, they uh, came up with this uh, doctrine of skipping over, so-called island hopping, this doctrine of skipping over Japanese defensive positions. Okay? Mm -hmm. Was that a MacArthur initiative, or was it something that uh, um, strategists in Pearl Harbor conceived? You know? Um, the first of these island hopping uh, initiatives started in early 1943 in the Solomons. This was a time when MacArthur was just making his uh, first offensive moves out of Australia. And it was only in 44 that uh, Southwest Pacific forces began to jump over Japanese garrisons on the coast of New Guinea uh, which then accelerated the uh, progress of uh, MacArthur's campaign toward getting back to the Philippines. So uh, is this a MacArthur development or is this a development that was uh, borrowed, let's say, from uh, CentPAC? Well, that's I would, a I would... dispute and uh, yeah, there have been some debates about this among historians. So I haven't done the detailed research to profile which historians have taken which positions on uh, which of these issues. Thank you. John? Okay. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Dr. Prozos. Uh, I missed you, the first part of your, your talk. So I'm going to ask you a general question about the Pearl Harbor. Uh, have you read the uh, uh, Robert Sinatra's uh, uh, book called The Day of Deceit? And do you agree with him that FDR and, and his uh, close advisors were aware that Japanese uh, you know, fleet was going to attack Pearl Harbor in advance? Um. I have, you're talking about the Stennis book? Yes. I've read the Stennis book. I think that, uh, uh, to answer your big question, I think that FDR was not specifically aware that the Japanese were about to attack Pearl Harbor. But uh, uh, to comment on the Stennis book uh, in general, I think that uh, I have a poor opinion of that book. I think that. Uh, he um, misuses evidence, he uh, contrives evidence, he um, leaves things uh, completely outside um, the uh, realm of the facts that need to be taken into account. And he makes up stuff. For example, uh, I'll, let me give you two examples out of that book. One, uh, he puts a very great weight on uh, a certain memorandum that is written months and months before the war by uh, a middle level US Navy intelligence officer in the Office of Naval Intelligence, okay? Who was somebody who was on the Japanese desk, but who was um, not particularly uh, not at all intimate with FDR, and yet Stennis behaves as if FDR and this naval commander uh, were sort of best buddies, and that FDR was directly implementing uh, the points in this commander's memorandum that was uh, uh, the equivalent of an op-ed piece in the newspaper, not the equivalent of a military strategy for the United States to carry out. But Stennis makes it that way. Another problem in the Stennis book is this thing with the Japanese messages 
uh, in the JN25 code. There was a, there were a series of messages that were intercepted by the United States. You know, on the days and at the moments that they were intercepted, which we did not have the resources to work on. So they sat in a file until the war was over and Japanese uh, code breakers, American code breakers working on Japanese code had time to spare and money to do it. So they sat down with these old messages and worked on them uh, to break them out. And Stennis uh, behaves as if we were contemporaneously reading this Japanese communications traffic and therefore had to be aware of whatever it is which were in all the different messages. So um, I think uh, those things make the Stennis book much less useful than it should have been and uh, uh, actually discredited. Thank you, Dr. Prados. Um, Mike, Mark, and Alex have questions. Uh, yes, uh, uh, John. Um, it seemed, well, first of all, as far as the island hopping campaign, I mean, most of the evidence uh, that I've seen really would give credit. I mean, if, when it comes to Supreme Commanders, it would give credit to Nimitz, not to MacArthur. M what MacArthur was very good at is taking credit for what other people did. Um, and it seems, judging starting with Clark Field and, and moving up with subsequent um, failures and combined with the successes on MacArthur's part, that he was less useful for his generalship or for his uh, um, acumen as a, uh, as a leader than he was for his self-aggrandizement, for his ability to sell a product. And that's great. They needed a hero, especially in 1942. And uh, they needed a hero at, at, at near the top of the chain of command. But we had a similar situation with uh, um, George Patton, who was an excellent tactician, um, terrible strategist, but and he was an army commander, but they never made him uh, Patton commander of all field forces of all forces in the field or all ground forces and much less making him a theater or supreme commander of a particular theater. What was the reason do you think that they elevated MacArthur to that level based on the information they had about him from the Clark field incident and what happened in the Philippines? That's an excellent question. Um, unfortunately, I don't think I could answer it well, but it is an excellent question. My speculation would be that um, the same reasons that we needed someone to be a hero in 1942 uh, sort of came back to bite us. We built this guy into such a hero that um, suddenly it seemed impossible to turn him down, it seemed that he needed to be uh, at the center of everything. If you look at the last war situation or the late, late, late war situation, if you like, you know, and MacArthur's in the Philippines completing the conquest of the Philippines and um, the question is becoming uh, okay, we're going to invade Japan, right? Who's going to be in charge of the Japanese invasion? MacArthur basically makes a bid to be the person in charge of the Japanese invasion, and uh, there's almost no turning him down. So I think that um, that moment there could be in microcosm uh, the explanation for uh, MacArthur's political hold, if you like, if you want to use that description. Um, over uh, American opinion. And maybe looking there, we might find some, uh, something to, to hold on to um, in this thinking about the building of the MacArthur name and reputation through this period. Mm -hmm. 
Thanks, John. Frankenstein's monster, then. Thanks, John. <laughs> Mike? I think Mark was next, uh, Jason. Oh, Mark? Okay, sure. Um, after the war, when the uh, Americans had access to Japanese records you know, uh, uh, during the war, was there anything about the Japanese judging MacArthur as a good general, bad general? And, and, and you know, in the same way, I know that happened with the Germans. Um, did it happen with the Japanese as well? Uh, I'm not sure what you're referring to here. You're talking about Americans and allies trying Japanese officers. As no, 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 no. You're talking about the general question of what evaluations of MacArthur exist in Japanese records. Yeah, exactly. What did they think of his, him as a general? Um, that is a good question. I have not found an American or a Japanese document mm -hmm. uh, that uh, gives their evaluation of MacArthur as a field commander. Um, that's not because, or at least I don't think it's because uh, Japanese officers didn't have opinions of MacArthur. And it's also not because um, the Japanese um, didn't have an interest in in having opinions like this, um, I'm not sure quite how to attribute this. It could have to do with the idea that we don't keep records of this kind. It could also have, do, have to do with the idea that they had time before the American occupiers arrived to destroy records, and they may have taken the opportunity to destroy any records of this kind. But in order not to embarrass the Americans? No, in order to not, uh, not be seen by the conquerors, by the Americans, not be seen to be um, collecting or putting down that kind of information, which might make the Americans angry. Huh. Huh. However, um, which isn't confined to MacArthur. I have not seen documents from the Japanese side that evaluate other American commanders other than MacArthur, besides MacArthur. Mm -hmm. So, um, can't get in here. I can't get in. It might be a cultural thing. You know? It might be that, uh, you know, we just don't keep records like that. Ted, I think I saw him momentarily. No, I had my, I had my, yeah, thank you very much. I put my hand up because I, First of all, it's a, it's, it's a, it is an excellent question, and it's a question that I am ashamed that I did not ask the people who would have written that. I never asked that question of MacArthur. I asked that question about many other Japanese um, opinions of other commanders on the other field, but I personally never asked the people who would have been able to answer, the General Tats Tatsumi, General Tanita, and some of the senior generals, and I didn't ask the colonels in the Philippines uh, what they thought of MacArthur. It's an interesting failure on my part, so I'm embarrassed by that. Um, but and I'll so I'm gonna next time I'm I'm there I'm gonna look look that question up and see what okay. I can. Okay. So I promise Great I'll get idea. that. So well maybe in another in a year from whenever I can get to Japan I'll get an answer from the War History Office. But but at the same time uh, the Japanese uh, were terrified of, of what was going to happen when MacArthur took over. It was a big shock, and between August 15th when they uh, ended the war. Uh, uh, declared the war over, and then September 2nd, when they when they uh, surrendered formally on the Missouri, that two month, that two week, three two and a half week, three week period. I guess he arrived on, on August 28th or something. He arrived in uh, in, uh, in, y in Yokosuka uh, at, th at that time, or at uh, in the on the 28th of, of August. But in that two week, two and a half week period, the Japanese government, and this is some, something I'm writing about now, uh, the Japanese um, emperor thought that they were going to they were going to transfer the government over to a new Jap to a Japanese prince who uh, and the prince actually became not a not a direct line prince but a, a, pr a prince without rank uh they turned the government over to him and he would then conduct the negotiations and be the japanese government in the post-war period uh but macarthur was having none of that uh he declared himself essentially uh you know scap supreme commander allied powers pacific and, and that, that was it and so the, there was no this dialogue when the japanese showed up to meet 
<laughs> they were told, what are you doing here? <laughs> you know, I, I'm t- I'll tell you. And he, of course, he got the best building in Tokyo, the only building besides the Imperial Palace uh, for his headquarters, right? There's one of the few buildings that was actually standing in Tokyo. So he merely went there right next to the Imperial Palace. And so he took over. But uh, that, that fact that he, he, they certainly wouldn't want it, wouldn't, wouldn't wanted to have, would not want to have had a large number of documents uh, trashing MacArthur if they existed, you know. So I don't, I don't, I doubt that. Uh, but his his strategies were, were in the, in New Guinea. I can speak a little bit about that. Were kind of baffling. They couldn't understand why he would do what he did. Uh, they couldn't understand why they landed on on Leyte uh, in the Philippines. Coming back, you know, talking forty four. Why did you pick that? Uh, they, of course, they did expect them to land in in Mindanao because it was closer to the main base that that whole controversy about why the philippines when you land in late day you, you the japanese knew that you couldn't build airfields there so so it was a terrible place for the operation against manila because the airfields was sank so it was a real problem real problem uh, and so the fact that they, we, we jumped to uh, to live from late day quickly to uh, um, manila was something the japanese commented on a lot so who made that strategic decision to pick late is, is an interesting question, which I, I don't know the answer to. Maybe some of the people here know why Leyte versus uh, something else. It was farther north. That's the only argument I can I can see. And of course, it also headed off the idea of invading to Taiwan, which of course was the Navy's dream idea, cut across, go, go right to Taiwan, take Formosa, cut off the whole thing in the south, which has some merit to it, but it would have been one hell of a battle in, Leyte, in the Taiwan because the geography is so horrible. Uh, uh, you know, giant island uh, would be a long, long campaign, like like Leyte turned out to be, even though Leyte was uh, un- unsupportable for the Japanese. So that's all I can say. But I really, th- I'm, that's a, it's it's so interesting that all these years I've been working on the Japanese army and the military, talking to all these people, I never quite asked that question. And so uh, you live and learn. Right? Maybe I can, maybe there's still time left. <laughs> Thank you. Let me comment on Leyte specifically. Because I have with them now. Um, I think that the decision to go for Leyte wasn't just MacArthur, it was kind of uh, a pot for we. Uh, the uh, Central Pacific Forces Nimitz's Theater were working on softening up the Philippines for uh, the invasion that uh, was coming. And at the time, Mindanao was the accepted uh, uh, target. Um, but it turned out that uh, um, the carrier forces, the task forces that were hitting the Philippines were uh, more successful than they expected to be. Yeah, I guess so. In the yeah. first two sets of uh, preparatory strikes that they carried out. So they approached the Joint yeah. Chiefs of Staff and Washington and everybody else, MacArthur too, um, since he was the one who was going to carry out this Mindanao uh, landing, um, with the idea of shifting the target to Leyte because it was better prepped than Mindanao was, and they could carry out that invasion uh, more easily. And the uh, high, higher ups accepted the idea. So I wouldn't attribute it directly to MacArthur, uh, although he was happy to go along with the idea. Interesting. Interesting. Mm-hmm. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Prados. Um, we have a number of people returning. Alex and Ralph have been very, very patient as we get to them, um, and then Brandon and Miles. So, Alex, uh, you want to okay. go ahead? Yeah, so as I'm sure many of us know, um, before the war started, um, MacArthur had talked to, you know, President Quezon and others about the Japanese declaring, in, uh, sorry, the Japanese, um, Philippine, Filipinos declaring, uh, well, the Philippines as a country, declaring independence and then neutrality. So I wonder, John, if you have any belief that that played some, that that somehow MacArthur held back with the airstrikes on Formosa, if, if that was, or was that just obviated by the fact that, okay, now we're at war, 
now we're you know our there's no chance you know they're not going to recognize um philippine uh, neutrality of the japanese so we're you know on to the fighting the war now um that's uh another one of these interesting um additional mysteries now you know that uh John Bulkley, who was at that time a lieutenant commander, I think, and led the first uh, PT boat squadron. That first PT boat squadron was um, the one was one that fought in the Philippines for the Asiatic fleet, and they were also the ones who evacuated MacArthur and Quezon uh, from Corregidor to Mindanao, from which uh MacArthur and Quezon were evacuated further to Australia. So that's how those guys got out of the Philippines in order to fight another day. Anyway, um, it was Bokali's opinion, uh, talking from talking to Quezon, that um, Quezon attributed the stalling of the Formosa air attack to MacArthur, number one, and number two, that MacArthur did that because he, uh, Quezon, that is, is the origin of this idea that somehow uh, the Philippines could be kept neutral if the United States took no aggressive action from the Philippines. So, um, for what it's worth, uh, there is actually uh, some commentary on this point. Am I next? You are. Okay, thank you. Uh, so um, uh, on uh, MacArthur's handling of the defense of the Philippines in the first place, my understanding is that there was a defensive strategy which understood that they couldn't stand up to a Japanese attack uh, along the coast, that the idea was um, when they knew uh, a major attack was coming, uh, that they would withdraw, that is the US and the Filipino troops would be mostly withdrawn to Bataan and to hold on there. And the idea was to prepare the Bataan Peninsula with adequate supplies um, uh, so that a large army could be sustained there for an indefinite amount of time. And um, my understanding also is that uh, MacArthur, who had signed on to this, um, didn't actually implement it in a hurry. Uh, actually, he did make some attempts to stop the, uh, the Japanese attacks along the coast. And, um, uh, and then they found that the Bataan Peninsula was not adequately pre-supplied uh, to comfortably sustain, um, you know, this large army for uh, a, a long amount of time. You know, we, we can't know that this would have ultimately saved the U.S. and Filipino troops there since, uh, you know, you needed a Navy that could could somehow come to their relief. Um, but but still, it was uh, uh, it presented a major problem for, uh, you know, those heroic defenders of Bataan. Um, so uh, I'm wondering uh, whether you have any. Um, insights from uh, your background and your uh, research on that, on, on you know, MacArthur's uh, uh, not going along with that plan? Um, it's definitely true that uh, our plans for defending the Philippines were uh, worked out on the supposition that an American fleet was going to organize across the Pacific and relieve United States forces in the Far East. It's of course true that after Pearl Harbor, there was, if there ever had been, no chance that American forces would actually succeed 
in getting to the Philippines within any length of time that a force could uh, hold on to Bataan uh, waiting for them. That said, um, I don't think it was especially um, MacArthur's fault, if you want to take it that way, that uh, uh, there were attempts to mount a conventional defense of the whole Philippines. I think that they did pretty much withdraw into Bataan. Um, maybe we're looking at covering forces and delaying forces as uh, stand-ins for a real attempt at defense uh, rather than being delaying forces and covering forces. But we did uh, pull back into Bataan fairly quickly. Um, I'm not, I, not uh, I don't have the data to uh, comment on whether the level, the scale of logistics that were accumulated in the Bataan Peninsula was in fact sufficient for the size of the force. Uh, I would suspect not since uh, the whole sort of story of Bataan is how we were on this shoestring uh, basis. However, um, I don't think that Bataan was um, overcome by uh, shortage of supplies so much as by um, our inability to um, cope with uh, the level of Japanese tactical deployment. The Japanese made excellent use of small scale amphibious operations along the coasts, uh, which outflanked the successive defensive lines that uh, the American and Filipino armies had created. And um, down the center of the Japan Peninsula, where uh, the major formations of the American army uh, came together and had their flanks, the Japanese were very good at infiltrating through these uh, sort of flank uh, area gaps. Uh, again, outflanking the American forces so that uh, the successive defense lines were pretty largely overcome by these kinds of outflanking tactics. Mm. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we have Brandon and then we have Miles. Um, yeah, real quickly on this on this last uh, question, I recently read a book, it's pretty obscure, I think, called The Twilight Riders, which is about uh, the 26th Cavalry, which which basically was central to the uh, retreat in, in the Philippines, uh, slowing down the Japanese forces, as, as, as you just said, that, you know, as the lines were uh, continually out of flank. But the, the assumption in the book is that there was, MacArthur had sort of half implemented a plan where he was training a larger Philippine army and together they were going to defend, take them, let's just put it this way, take a more aggressive or forward approach to defending along the beaches and all that. I don't think, at least according to this book, that a lot of his subordinate commanders were particularly optimistic about this plan and then they changed horses in midstream and it was kind of thrown into Wainwright's lap to make it work and by the skin of their teeth and the point in the book is that these guys were on horses that were doing the delaying action fighting tanks um that they just barely got in and one of the big problems was yes you know he, MacArthur had asked for and hoped for both both before the hostilities broke out and after more supply, more weapons, and so forth, that were not forthcoming. But the supplies that were on the island, on the archipelago, weren't really pulled back. At least half of the strategic supplies were, were had to be burned or were just abandoned um, because 
basically surprised, surprised at what you're saying, the, the Japanese tactics that just completely outflanked and they were, they had no way to. So, so part of the fall of Corregidor really, according to this book, was based on uh, not being able to pack in enough supply, even, even the local depots for what it's worth. Okay. Uh, and I'm sure that's true. Uh, and you also um, refer to uh, this question of uh, outside supply. I just wanted to, to underline that. Um, in addition to the commentary on the previous question, because uh, one of the uh, imponderables about the defense of the Philippines in 1941-42 is what might have been the impact if that convoy that had started out through Australia um, had actually reached the Philippines before the beginning of the war. A lot of uh, personnel and equipment for the Far East Air Forces, a bunch of supplies for the ground forces, some armored equipment and uh, motor, motorized vehicles that could have uh, assisted uh, MacArthur's forces. Uh, and some troops were all aboard that convoy. And it might have made a significant difference in uh, American slash Filipino ability to defend uh, Luzon. Right. Unfortunately, that's an imponderable, it's an unanswerable question because the war started when it started. I think Miles was next. Yes. You're muted, Miles. You got to mute, Miles. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, on the subject of um, uh, MacArthur's assignment in the um, in the Pacific after he leaves Corregidor, um, a discussion of that seemed to have suggested that uh, um, he did very well on that, too well considering his his record. Um, I, I would like to suggest that um, he was kind of exiled there, that the view of him in the War Department uh, was not terrific, that um, uh, I'm not sure that he and, and, and Marshall were really on speaking terms. That may be an exaggeration, but I don't think Marshall thought very highly of him, and um, or vice versa. But anyhow... He winds up not with the command of the Pacific. This is a theater that is split with the Navy. And um, uh, he, he, he winds up in an area with very uh, low resources at, at, at the end of the supply chain um, with a, at that point, relatively low strategic um, uh, priority. And um, he... Um, I, I think I am no fan of MacArthur's, but I, I suggest he did fairly well with uh, without a terribly good hand uh, at that point. But um, and, and as, as mentioned, he's certainly a um, master of PR, but um, the army did not benefit from that at, at all. I mean, when you you think about this, this um, audience here probably represents 10% of all Americans who ever heard about the American Army in the Pacific. And um, the uh, Marines triumphed in the PR campaign. Everybody knows about Iwo Jima and Okinawa, and that's been, um, uh, led by John Wayne. And um, the, uh, uh, hardly anybody knows anything about uh, MacArthur's campaign through uh, New Guinea and the Solomons, other than a, a bit about the about Guadalcanal, which is again taken over by the Marine Corps reputation. So um, um, MacArthur comes out of it personally, but his um, his, his troops get uh, zip, and um, again, I I kind of uh, think of him as in in, in exile down there. 
with um, having to contend with the Navy having the command of the Central Pacific and getting a lot of the resources and um, and and almost all of the uh, uh, of the favorable PR. So uh, I, I I would look at that a, a, a bit differently. I see his reputation as being substantially uh, re- redeemed by the uh, occupation of Japan and his relationship with the Japanese, which was like uh, uh, my view masterful. Um, some people people might might not see that, but um, that's my impression, and um, I, I would like to to hear. What do you think about that, Dr. Fados, and, uh, and others here? Okay. I understand um, where you're coming from with these comments, Miles. That's, a, um, that's a, an easy place to get to, let's put it that way. But I think that there's more and uh, additional considerations involved here. Don't forget that um, this is all taking place within a, the context of figuring out how to conduct a global war. And the United States and, and the United Kingdom in particular are trying to slice up the world, cut it up into pie slices that would uh, issue And um, from a very early uh, stage of this whole thing, uh, when they're still fighting in Malaya and the Netherlands East Indies, it was already thought that um, what became the China-Burma-India theater would be one of these, later became the Southeast Asia Command you know, would be one of these uh, combined commands and that the Pacific might be another one. But the question of what to do with Australia fell into the middle. And it was uh, early on a point of, I won't say dispute, but a point of interest, let's say, between the United States and the United Kingdom. What would be done to Australia? Would it be part of what the Chinese Southeast Asia Command? Would it be part of the Pacific Command? Uh, the idea was uh, soon adopted that it would be its own command. And then um, came, of course, the question of who should be the commander. Now, Field Marshal Archibald Wavell, uh, a British officer, was. Uh, already the supreme commander for what was called the uh, um, Australian, British, Dutch, uh, ABDA, um, the, uh, uh, the combined command that started out in Malaya and the East Indies. And that was the command that withdrew to India, China, and eventually to become CBI and SEAC. And so that was a British command. Then um, the Central Pacific Command, which became Nimitz's command, was um, a force that was overwhelmingly American. So there was no question but that an American should take that command. The remaining question was who takes over what becomes the Southwest Pacific Command? And um, here is MacArthur, the war hero. I think it was actually uh, agreed between the United States, and, between FDR and Churchill. I think it was already agreed that MacArthur would take over the Australian Command, the Southern Command even before he left the Philippines. So uh, although what you say about uh, MacArthur doing a good job when he's like at the end of the shoestring war uh, in 
42 and early in 43. I think that's correct. I agree with you. But um, I think that the, um, the rationale for his getting that command assignment um, wasn't, uh, how should I put it? It wasn't a random purpose. It was intended by the allowed high command. Sorry, I seem to be having a stuck Zoom uh, mic button. Um, I believe Theodore, uh, Ted is next, and then Joe, and then Miles is back after that for a follow-up. I have to say before we go there that uh, I'm just about out of time here. Okay. So why don't we just leave it for two questions? Okay, um, so Joe and the, I mean, uh, Ted and then Joe. Yeah, I'll be very, I'll be very brief, but I just have a specific question. I want to go back a little bit to uh, Batan and the argument that uh, Stanley Falk went over that way, way, way back, very early, and I think he he really did it. I thought a very good job on that that first cut on what was really happened, what happened at Batan. I think he does talk about the supply defi deficit, the failure of the of the things that was that were purchased to ever show up at the depots. But I was very, the question I wanted to ask was about uh, the, making, uh, making Manila an open city, because that was an amazing decision, uh, because it, it provided, it, it theoretically would have protected the Manila people of the Philippines from the battle, a battle through the city. But certainly no one, and certainly MacArthur, did not show any reticence to, to annihilating Manila uh, three years later, or two and a half years later, in 44. I mean, everything in the, that was there above ground was destroyed. Uh, in that campaign against the Japanese defenders uh, at that time. So it wasn't just to save Filipino lives, at least two years later, it wasn't. But it's an interesting uh, issue. I just wonder if you knew anything about how that decision was made and that's um, the two to, to make it an open city and defend away from it. Because he kept the, he kept the island in the middle, he kept uh, Corregidor, uh, but uh, that's all, thank you. Uh, that's a good question. Uh, and a good point, the comparison between 1941-42 and 1944-45 as well. I think in 44-45, there was some um, hope, if you like, that uh, Manila would be an open city and there wouldn't be a city fight for it. But that um, I've seen that attributed to the Japanese, actually, that... Uh, Yamashita's Japanese army forces were ready to uh, consider yes, that's uh, correct. Manila an open city, but that the Japanese naval forces uh, insisted on defending. I, I mean, because they and they were they were they were removed from their own command. I mean, the navy forces were cut off. That's one of the arguments that's made in defense of the atrocities. I mean, it's, it's not in defense of the atrocities, but it's meant that these these men were abandoned. Uh, many, many of them were abandoned troops. Uh, but it is an interesting question, and I've I've pondered it in the context of 44, 45, uh, mm -hmm. and talked to people who were responsible for some of the atrocities uh, that were committed there, and uh, or at least were blamed for them. Uh, and so it's always been interesting to me that you immediately you try Yamasta and get rid of him, uh, <laughs> who who was really the, he his great victories were against the British. You know, the first trial was Yamasta, oh. who really wasn't responsible for the um, much of what happened in the Philippines in 45. Yeah. Thank you. I think also, just to go back to 41, that uh, our war plan of uh, focusing the defense on Bataan was uh, considered as much as, um, as could be done with the limited Filipino and US forces that were available so that making Manila an open city was a, a logical thing to do. It was the best propaganda move they could make given their forces and their war plan. That, however, is just my speculation. I don't have uh, concrete evidence for that. So our last question will be Joe. 
Okay, John. So what is your overall assessment assessment of Brereton? I mean, not just the Manila, where I suggest it'd be spotty, but then he's also in charge of the bombing operation at Normandy, and they give him the airborne operation at Market Garden. So obviously he's thought highly of somewhere, but he never gets a fourth star. So what do you think? I think that uh, Brereton was marked after um, Manila in 1941, after Clark Field. Um, and that's the reason he never got a fourth star. Um, but you're quite right. I mean, he was uh, at the center of a whole lot of uh, uh, allied uh, moves, ranging from uh, U.S. support to the British Eighth Army in the Western Desert to uh, air support in the Italian campaign to um, the air support that was behind the Sicily and Italy landings to, as you say, the Normandy campaign and then uh, Arnhem. Now, in each of those places, there were mistakes that happened and those things certainly didn't uh, make Brereton's uh, situation easier. But uh, you're right, not only did he not get a four star, but he didn't get a new uh, post-war command either. So something definitely uh, happened to his reputation uh, and it happened, I think, right here. Thank you. Thank you everyone, especially Dr. Prados for a really engaging and interesting uh, afternoon. I'm going to throw it over to Jim in case Jim has any uh, last minute comments. Uh, I just want to thank Jim for organizing this um, and bringing us all together today. Well, I want to thank uh, both, uh, both Jason and Ken. Uh, we got Ken up early in the morning in California. So he's been uh, stalwart in doing this. And I also want to thank uh, uh, Joe and uh, Ray Tillman, Ralph Chipman, Mindy Kotler, Miles Fisher, John Kim, Joe, um, Brandon, of course, uh, I'm leaving out the usual suspects, but all the people who came, Patrick Deer came, uh, Patrick Deer runs a program at NYU in the English department on war and literature. And he also has been doing some yeoman work in sponsoring writing workshops of Iraq and Afghanistan veterans for the past several years. He's one of the guys responsible for that whole operation. Um, we're going to next, uh, March 5th, we're going to have P professor Mark Stoller. Uh, Mark is a a professor emeritus of the University of New Hampshire, and he will be talking about the politics of the Second Front. And then we're going to have uh, Gary. Gary's going to be doing two presentations on D-Day and uh, Operation Sledgehammer. And then in uh, April, we're going to have uh, David O'Keefe, who is a author of a new book on Dieppe, and uh, if we have uh, other people from Canada coming in, we'll probably mo mo make that into a conference on Dieppe. And then uh, in late April, we're going to have sort of a roundup of what occurred uh, in terms of looking at the Second Front. And I just got an email from uh, Robert Paxton, uh, who uh, some of us know is a retired professor from the Department of History at Columbia. And Robert was uh, involved in um, actually stirring up the controversy along with Marcelo Fool's movie, The Sorrow and the Pity, in France, when he did his book, Vichy and the Jews. Uh, and it was a whole big controversy domestically about uh, what happened in the issue of collaboration with the Germans during the war. So he's going to come talk about a subject that he actually presented on in France in a documentary series uh, several years ago before he retired, and that is, would the Vichy French have fought against the Americans if they landed in France in 1942? So, uh, stay tuned, and we want to, of course, thank John for being such uh, a great and gracious individual with all the knowledge he has. Thank you so much, John. I'm sure we all, everybody, you know, I guess, you know, they all clap their hands, right? <laughs> but thanks, John. Thanks a lot. Thank you.